the vast majority of municipalities are defunct. You've got youth unemployment rates way above 50%. You've got um, poverty and hunger on grand scales. And David, that was all before we arrived at the coronavirus pandemic and all of the attenuated lockdowns. It is nearly a year since the July 2021 riots, which rocked KZN and Gauteng. These riots cost the country almost 37 billion rands. Are we prepared for a risk of a similar nature again? And can we meet the financial obligations of our insurance readiness for such an event? Joining me to discuss is Jonathan van Rensburg. He is a senior consultant with BTS. So Jonathan, you and I spoke just in the aftermath of the riots last year about the potential insurance implications. And I see now that Lloyd's, the reinsurer, has hiked its rates for Sastria, the state insurance company, by a thousand percent. That is quite an extraordinary number. Could you tell us about this process? How would they have arrived at that calculation? And what does that mean in terms of risks for South Africa? So yes, when we were thinking about this last year, we weren't quite sure how big the claims would be. We weren't quite sure um, uh, where all of that would land. We've got much firmer evidence now. Sassari has cl closed the claims process and they said somewhere between 33 and 36 billion is the final number from the claims point of view. The other data point we now have is we've got Lloyds coming through and saying, we have reevaluated the risk of this event, this calamity happening, and we see it as 1,000% um, either more likely or more pricey, one of the, one of the two things. Uh, just to explain this, David, I think it's important to understand what's the, what is insurance, what's the product they're selling. Fundamentally, if I'm an insurer uh, and you're paying me premiums, you're paying me each month um, a, a, an X amount of, of, of rands to insure you against something. Could be that your that your phone gets stolen or your car gets dinged or something happens to your health. There's a whole range of insurance that could be sold. And in return, I insure you um, in the event that the thing does happen, I'll pay you out. So that's the scenario we found ourselves in. We were in the payout scenario. Um, this is the this is the moment that uh, the insurers, uh, you know, this is why they exist to pay out these sorts of claims. Now, what happened in this instance is uh, firstly. Uh, you know, Sassria insured against a risk, some of the damages that happened, they're, they're an anomalous type of insurer. There are not many of those that, that exist in the world that would insure against this kind of risk, but they did. And the claims came to 33 to 36 billion rand. Now, the first thing we'd want to ask is, well, how much, you know, how much did you have in reserve in order to pay that claim, right? We've been paying our premiums each month. Your job now is to, to meet those claims. And what we can see from the more recent financial disclosures is that really Sassari had somewhere between five and 10 billion rand available to pay and 36 billion that it needed to pay. So that necessitated them needing to go to the Fiscus and ask for 22 billion rand in bailout. It's effectively um, a state-owned enterprise. It's the, the Fiscus, the treasury is the, is the shareholder and they needed to, to bail them out in this instance. So I think the crux here is that that equation didn't quite match up. Something went wrong between premium and payout. Okay, and when we talk about Sastria, the state-owned insurance company, going to the Treasury, that's ultimately taxpayers are going to fit the bill for that. What does this say about our ability to forecast these kinds of risk events? Do you think insurers have been sufficiently factoring in these kinds of calamitous uh, riots or, or civil unrest into their insurance models? Well, it's, it's, it's a really important question, David. So I think, uh, you know, at the, at the outset, most of the time, we uh, insurers might look at an event like the July unrest and say that's a black swan event. Black swan event being something that uh, a, a quant named uh, Nassim Nicholas Talib um, coined after the financial crash, and it was trying to encapsulate things that could not be predicted. Now, the question we'd need to, to, to answer is, uh, well, is that really the case? Could we not predict the fact that uh, something like this could happen? And especially given the plethora of, of evidence from civil society organizations like the CRA and others, right? We've got Auditor General reports saying that, uh, you know, the vast majority of municipalities are defunct. You've got youth unemployment rates way above 50%. You've got um, poverty and hunger on grand scales. And David, that was all before we arrived at the coronavirus pandemic and all of the attenuated lockdowns. 
So you, you had a whole bunch of data points, possibly one of the most important ones that was coming out of the CRA in particular, was the escalating level of violence in service delivery protest in the last decade. So Nassim Taleb himself talks about the difference between black and gray swans. Some of these are more predictable than others. So the, to answer your question, uh, to what extent or how well are we managing to turn that data into correct forecasts of the future? I think the SASRE event might be um, asking, you know, putting a very firm emphasis on that point exactly. Now, in the grand scheme of things, SASRE is an organization of about 10 billion rand in assets. It's, it's big in money, but small in terms of other financial institutions. Someone like Sunlum is closer to a trillion rand. The question that we'd want to ask is, is our professional class, are the people that are thinking about these issues close enough to the, to the actual coalface of what's going on in South Africa to interpret that information and turn it into um, the correct financial forecasts? Sasria, the, the Sasria context seems to say that, we, that that's something that we need to work on. Yeah, so these kinds of fat tail risks, I mean, do you think that maybe this has been a paradigm shifting event now insurers have, have kind of woken up to the extent of state failure, incapacity of the security services to deal effectively with unrest of this nature. Do you think that the, the model is now changed? David, I think we're figuring it out. And that's really what uh, what uh, uh, financial professionals across, um, across the board are going to need to be grappling with, right? Because it's not only in insurance that uh, predicting of the future is an important thing to do. You need to figure out the probability of a future outcome and the potential payment that you'd need to make if you're an insurer in this sort of space. Well, banks are doing a very similar sort of thing. Every time they're lending to someone in certain geographies, certain types of businesses or individuals, they're needing to figure out if those people are good lends. They're needing to forecast the future as to whether they'd manage to get that money back. So my answer to you at this stage is I think it's a, it's a state of flux and uh, really what we need to do as a financial community generally is go and find this data and find ways to put it into, um, into these future forecasting models. Yeah, and many uh, economists at leading financial institutions or risk strategists have perhaps been a bit reluctant to voice concern about the extent of the breakdown in governance in the country. And perhaps I think this is a, a good wake up call to say, well, Actually, there are some pretty serious risk factors uh, coming uh, towards you as an institution and towards your customers as well. Uh, so what would be your advice, Jonathan, for uh, financial institutions and also ordinary people to try and mitigate these risks and to be able to see maybe some of the potential future implications and costs that might be coming down the pipeline? David, I think it boils down fundamentally to a mindset concern. I don't think we have a, a deficit from a capability point of view. We, we, we have smart people in this country. We know how to think about these sorts of issues. We need to shift, um, we need to shift our mindsets and make sure that we're trying to incorporate uh, uh, data points from, a, from, from you know, further than just the towns and cities that we live in. We've got to find ways of uh, reflecting the true and honest picture of what's happening in these spaces. Um, and that is fundamentally a, 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 a mindset shift of the folks that are needing to, you know, to predict these sorts of outcomes. So the information is there. Um, we need to be realistic about uh, uh, you know, obtaining it and, and, uh, and turning it into something useful. Jonathan van Rensburg, thank you very much for joining us on the CRA. Let's hand over to you, our audience. What do you think will be the financial implications of ongoing civil unrest and violent protest in South Africa? Leave your thoughts down in the comments section below. Also, don't forget to like this video and do check out our website for more information on the CRA's various services. My name is David Ansara. Until next time, take care.